but before we get our presentation started, I want to let notify you that Syngenta as host will record the webinar via Zoom and the recording will be emailed out to attendees and published on our website and social media feeds after the event. Uh, please no recording by anyone else or other means is permitted. If you would like to ask a question, I have set the Zoom Q&A function so that you may do so privately by addressing your question to the panelists and not to everyone. If you have any questions about Syngenta's data privacy policies, please visit our privacy policy, which is available at syngentaflowers-us.com slash privacy-policy. And now with that, I will hand it over to Mark Smith, our first presenter. So good morning, everybody. Today, uh, Nancy and I are gonna run through uh, some uh, ideas on finishing your garden mums as we approach the end of the garden mum season. First, a couple cultural tips. Um, so at the end of the season, uh, the big thing to remember, especially for natural season growers, is every year is a little different. So it's really important to take good notes uh, to refer back to for future years and make sure in those notes you're making comments about what the weather was like uh, and how the varieties finished because uh, obviously the weather does influence um, variety timing. The two uh, key factors, water and fertilizer, they should be used throughout the crop to steer which way you want things to go. Uh, growth regulators are really about adjusting for some individual variety differences. They shouldn't be thought of as the mainstream uh, control of the crop. So we'll talk a little bit about water. Um, if your plants are looking large uh, and you're concerned about size, allowing the plants to wilt some in between irrigations can help reduce growth and will actually speed up flowering. If plants are looking small, uh, keeping things more evenly moist, not letting things dry out as much between irrigations, will increase overall uh, size. And this can occur even after buds are set. So you've still got an opportunity once you've got buds set to actually push significantly more growth. These are uh, adjustments to frequency of application, not the amount applied when irrigating. If we apply more water and we were applying sufficient water before, the excess is just gonna run out. So it's about uh, either spacing out your irrigations farther apart or irrigating more frequently with the same amount of water. And always we wanna be careful to avoid the extremes that will cause root damage as that will cause more problems with the crops. So never too, too dry, never too, too wet. In terms of fertilizer, uh, ammonium-based fertilizers, many growers are using those to start their crops. It helps keep the plants actively growing. Um, but at this time of the year, that's not what we're looking for. We want the crop to start thinking about uh, budding up. So we want to move away from ammonium-based fertilizers to more nitrate-based fertilizers. And we can also consider reducing the overall fertilizer concentration. If you are running at uh, 250, 300, 200, um, this is the time when we can start to bring that uh, concentration down. If you were using a low NPK feed at 100, 125, we're going to keep steady with that because we're going to use that all the way through the crop. Um, the switch to nitrate and reducing concentration will help uh, build a stronger plant. It won't be soft growth and it will minimize the de flowering delay uh, for natural crops. So growth regulators are a factor in growing a garden mum crop. Um, traditionally, B9 has been used and that's a great tool for toning growth early in the crop. Once you start to see uh, buds, uh, there's always the concern about potential with uh, flowering delay with B9. So I would suggest switching over to uh, bonsai as a drench, uh, where we see little to no uh, timing effect when used. Um, and the big thing about growth regulators is uh, what works for you may not work for somebody else. Um, so, Keep uh, good notes on what you've done uh, and, and what the conditions are so that you can refine and change your timing or change your concentrations and make things better year after year. So the 
probably the most common question that I get uh, in late July, early August, uh, certainly in the last four or five years, was about heat delay. So uh, obviously it is very difficult to cool a crop. I don't know of anybody who's got a greenhouse that is finishing garden mums with an air conditioner in it. Uh, I've seen some greenhouses like that, but they're not for finishing garden mums. Um, outdoor crops, obviously you're at the, the mercy of the weather, so you can't uh, heat or cool that crop. And so it's, it's a challenge. But let's talk about heat delay in general and, and what we should be concerned or not concerned about. So we wanna focus on the night temperature. Day temperatures can be extremely warm if our night is cooling off into the, uh, the 60s, uh, maybe even into the low 60s. Um, we shouldn't have any problems with heat. Uh, stagnant heat is worse than moving heat. So if I'm in a greenhouse and I've got passive ventilation and I don't have good air movement, at the same temperature, I'm gonna have more problems than a grower uh, who's got a fan that's pulling that hot air through the greenhouse or that has good use of uh, uh, horizontal airflow fans to keep things moving to, to stop dead spots in the greenhouse. Um, some varieties are gonna be more sensitive. In our uh, at a glance table, uh, we do have a column uh, for temperature tolerance in black cloth. Um, that's a pretty good guide as to which varieties are going to be uh, more or less susceptible to a high temperature condition, even for a natural season crop. And unfortunately, uh, uh, often as things are delaying because of heat, they're growing too much and we want to put more growth regulators on to keep things uh, uh, at the right size. But this can actually make things worse because we're, we start to get the growth regulator delay effect. So in a marginal photo period, this would be the, the time period where the plants are just starting to initiate, where the day length is getting just short enough for the plant to start thinking about flowering. Those warm temperatures will have a greater effect. It can overcome that photo period. Uh, so that's really where you've got to be thinking. That's where your, your most significant heat delay is going to occur is at that point of initiation. If you're using a variety and you say, well, you know, it's in the catalog and it says it flowers the first week of September, but I'm always able to ship that uh, about the 25th of August. Um, those are the varieties that are going to be a little bit uh, more susceptible to uh, higher temperatures. So be careful on those. Um, in a warm year, that early initiation isn't going to occur. It will flower like the catalog says, and you are going to find it flowering later than you want. If you're black clothing, uh, black clothing for more hours uh, does not have a uh, positive effect uh, when you're using the right varieties. There are certain varieties that do benefit from longer periods of black cloth, but uh, those are not on the list that we recommend for black cloth use. And if you're doing a natural season crop and you're noticing that you're going to have warm weather around the point of initiation, uh, pulling black cloth over them to, to increase that uh, night period to make that photo period effect stronger and help to overcome some of that heat. The biggest thing is take those good notes, but don't make radical changes one year to the next um, because the weather is going to change. Uh, it might go back to normal. And if we make a radical change, we'll, we'll end up with things going in the opposite direction. So now I just want to run through some uh, things that we've seen over the years. Um, uh, just some good example pictures and some explanations as to what's occurring. So in this case, I've got some yellow plant plants. I've got some green plants. They're all kind of uh, together in the same tray and you wonder, well, what's going on here? <clears throat> so we've got a pH problem. The yellow plants are uh, in, a, in a media where the pH is too high. In this case, uh, it's because of a, a, a bad soil mix. Um, so uh, certain pots are showing it more than others. If the entirety of your crop is showing it, could just be high alkalinity water that's causing the pH to rise in a container. Um, so uh, if it is alkalinity, acidify the water. We'd like uh, the alkalinity between 80 and 120. Uh, that's the easiest way to fix that problem. If you can't acidify your water using a fertilizer, like a pH low fertilizer, will help to uh, offset that alkalinity. 
Also making sure you've got chelated iron in the fertilizer mix, that, that iron is more available, that will help reduce some of that yellowing. If your mix overall is just way high in uh, pH, uh, iron sulfate drenches can be used, but we've gotta be really careful. Uh, if we get any on the foliage, we've gotta make sure to clear, uh, to rinse with clear water afterwards so we don't get burning. <coughs> Here's another example of yellowing um, on the, uh, the upper growth. Um, in this case, so when the EC and the pH are within the proper range, now we're thinking hot temperatures could also be staying too wet. If uh, the plant's been under regular rainfall or you're over irrigating, um, in both cases, uh, you're, you don't have enough, uh, or you don't have the plants, don't have the ability to move water and nutrients up in the plants. The tip growth is what's going to yellow out. Um, once we can get to cooler temperatures, once we can get that media dried down, get some more air in the mix, uh, we can get the color to return. A, a Band-Aid approach, um, it, it temporarily corrects. It doesn't solve the root cause of the problem, but foliar sprays with chelated iron can help green things up. And again, we just want to make sure we're putting this on late in the evening to avoid foliage injury. So here we've got some lopsided mums flowering on one side, not on the other. Um, this is the uh, Barberton Mum Festival up in Ohio. And in this case, we've got light drift. So there's a street lamp uh, to the left that was not turned off and that lit half the mums. The shady side of the mums went ahead and flowered as they wanted to, but the other side is going to take a lot longer to come in the flower. You've got light interference around your growing area. Uh, oftentimes, mums are grown out in the field. You could have a street lamp someplace. Uh, you could have a lamp on, uh, on a building. Uh, we want to make sure we've got two foot candles or less uh, where the plants are to not have a light interference effect. So another example of uh, differences in flowering in the middle of the picture, uh, you can see some plants that uh, don't show any uh, flower color. Uh, they look a little softer green. They seem a little bit larger overall. Um, this is out in the middle of the field. We don't have a light drift issue here. In this case, we've got a wet spot. So that's actually the, uh, the sort of uh, overhead irrigation where the, the excess water drains to in the middle of the field and then runs left to right out of the field. So those plants are running moist and what happens? Well the drier plants they're going to flower faster, they're going to stay in, in a smaller size. The moister plants they're going to take a little longer to flower, they're going to keep on growing, they're going to keep uh, gaining on size uh, because of that extra moisture. So here we've got uh, garden mums being finished in a greenhouse. On the uh, right hand side, we've got some color over by the vent wall toward the middle of the greenhouse. Things look a whole lot greener. In this case, the difference in flowering is related to temperature. Um, by the vent wall, cools off faster uh, as you go into the night than what we have in the middle of the greenhouse. If we had uh, exhaust fans on the opposite side pulling air all the way through the greenhouse, that would be beneficial. Or even just more uh, horizontal airflow fans to help uh, push the air, circulate the air, reduce the difference from one end to the other, and keep that air moving more means uh, the plants can tolerate a higher temperature. And what about these uh, lopsided plants in these window boxes? What happened here? Um, if you notice, the drip tape's running along one side of the box. And the drip tape was used to put on a bonsai drench uh, that didn't end up with an even application in the root zone. So we don't, always want to make sure the media is moist enough for the drench before we apply so that we get good movement within the uh, uh, soil. We don't want it to just all stay in one spot. Um, Pulse irrigation, especially with a, a shallow, uh, wide container that would allow water to move more laterally, um, that would be a great tool. And then just having more drippers, either two tapes on the uh, window box or repositioning the window box to uh, be parallel with the drip tape and end up with two, tape, two drips in the box. 
Now we'll go into some uh, insect and disease issues, and I'm going to hand over to my colleague Nancy Rex Eagle to uh, talk about these. Nancy, you need to unmute. There we go. Okay. All right. So, what is causing the leaves and stems to kind of die back in these pots? The answer is. You have to change it for me then, Mark. There you go. Uh, fusarium. Uh, fusarium infections typically begin in July, invading through compromised roots, but it does take a while for the infection to move up into the canopy. So symptom expression is usually observed later, generally in August or even sometimes as late as September. Um, we typically suggest that growers put on a medallion drench after transplant, uh, typically in early July, to protect the roots. Uh, and this will also um, pre prevent any fusarium spores from, from germinating and invading. Um, and then later on in the end of July uh, or early August, come in with a treatment of heritage or mural to, to provide some further protection till the end of production. Um, the order of this application is actually very important because in July, we're trying to prevent the fusarium from invading the roots. While later in the season, while we're still trying to prevent the invasion of the pathogen, the systemic properties of these products allow the fungicide to actually enter the tissue uh, in the upper roots and the crown area to prohibit the pathogen from further invasion uh, and from advancing. So um, last summer, we conducted a trial uh, with Dr. Dave Norman from the University of Florida at the Apopka Research Station. Um, this was an inoculated trial and he applied the treatments two days prior to inoculation and then again 13 days after inoculation as a drench kind of over the top of the plants of getting down into that upper crown area. Um, you can see that all the treatments provide a good control of the pathogen uh, with mural uh, keeping the disease below 15% and the A number fungicide showing superior control overall. Um, you'll be hearing more about our new fungicide uh, in the next few weeks as we're expecting registration uh, the end of August or early September. Here are some pictures from the trial. You can see how the inoculated control looks um, devastated and in the next slide you can see uh, mural and, uh, and the new fungicide treatment um, showing some really nice control. Okay, so now let's take a moment and review some of the pest problems that you might encounter on your mums. Uh, the pictures of the pests are, are in the upper section with the respective damage that they do. Uh, you can see them below that. Um, it would not be unusual to use a broad spectrum pyrethroid spray to control many of these pests, but I would caution you against doing this today since we have many good options registered that are less disruptive to beneficials uh, and they also won't flare mites. Um, mainspring, for example, is a, is a good broad spectrum insecticide that can be used to effectively control all of these pests while providing some long residual protection. For aphids, we also have products such as Endeavor and Ventigra. Uh, they're in IRAC group 9A and 9D. Um, these products target, provide targeted control of aphids uh, without uh, flaring mites or causing any problems to beneficials. And they generally provide about 14 days of residual control. For leaf miner and thrips, uh, we have Conserve in IRAC group five and Avid uh, in IRAC group six. And then of course, Conserve also works well for controlling worms. Um, so you have a nice complement of products that can be used to control um, these pests. Next slide. Just wanted to share some data uh, illustrating uh, the residual activity that you can get uh, with some of these other products like Endeavor and Ventigra. Uh, in this trial, one spray was applied um, and then you can see, you know, it killed all the aphids on day seven. More aphids were applied on day seven to look at the residual activity of these product, products. 
Uh, you can see day 14, basically a flat line. They're still controlling the aphids. And even 21 days, you still see some solid suppression uh, of the aphid population. Next slide. So mums are also prone to many different lepidopteran pests, such as various armyworms and loopers, but Dupont chelia is one that you should also be on the lookout for. Um, unlike other lepidopteran pests, which typically feed on plant foliage, the larvae of this pest drops down uh, to the soil level after it hatches because it prefers to feed on the lower stem at, and the crown uh, area there at the soil line. It does have a broad host range and it will feed on both herbaceous as well as woody ornamentals. So mums, poinsettias, woodies, they are all game. Uh, you can see the picture in the upper left corner of the, of the immature stage, the larval stage. Uh, and below that, you can actually see the actual size of this pest. It's, it's in uh, actually Dandy Jones's hand. He picked up some soil. You can see actually the larvae is quite small and can often be mistaken for fungus gnat larvae, except the body of it is a little bit dark. So the damage you see in the center, oop, go back, Mark. One slide, go back. Can you go back one slide? No, thanks. Um, the feeding damage that you see there uh, at the base, that was on a privet, uh, a woody ornamental. Um, and if you look to the right, that was on heuchera. And the pest will actually bore into the stem and cause the plant to uh, appear wilted or collapse. So you may think that the plant is suffering from a root issue, uh, but take a closer look because you may actually have some activity from Duponchelia. The middle picture uh, in the, the upper part of the middle picture, um, you may be able to see there's some webbing there on the soil surface. This is an indication that you do have activity of Duponchelia. Uh, it does like to create kind of a webbing to protect itself and sometimes moisture droplets will collect on it so you can, you can tell that you have some activity. Um, there are pheromone traps that you can purchase um, that will help you monitor for male activity. And of course, if there's males, the females are probably not far behind. So it's a good tool you can use uh, in your scouting program. Next slide. We conducted a trial last year with Dr. J.C. Chong from Clemson on this pest. And um, this trial was conducted at a nursery um, where activity from this pest had been observed over the past several years. Um, you can see that um, we had both mainspring and acelaprin in this trial, and they both worked equally well on this pest, providing um, a good seven weeks of protection with uh, one sprinch application over the top of the plant. Next. JC also conducted some trials in 2018 on bean armyworm, another common pest on mums. Uh, and as you can see that the diamides work extremely well uh, controlling these caterpillar uh, pests um, and they work well at extremely low rates. Uh, two and four ounces is providing some excellent activity. See, see there about a month of control. The purple bar is um, looking 30, it's actually 49 days after a drench treatment. Um, so you can see there's still some excellent control with both products that are used as a spray or as a dredge. Next. The final pest I'll talk about today is leaf beetle. This pest can really wreak havoc on mums in a very short period of time. They do feed on the upper epidermis of the plant, causing uh, those pitted areas that you see on the foliage. They do move around very quickly, uh, so it's likely you'll see the injury before you actually see the pest. Products like Flagship and Safari and Marathon in IREC Group 4A worked well to control flea beetle for many years. Uh, but now that this class of chemistry is not being used as much, growers are having to rely on other products um, and frequent applications of pyrethroids uh, and carbaryl to control them, uh, which of course can flare other problems. We have been evaluating mainspring and acelaprin for efficacy on this pest. Next slide, please. And in this trial, applications were made on a 14-day interval um, 
to, to look at efficacy. Uh, we definitely saw some additive protection with each subsequent application of both the products. Um, Mainspring providing some better activity on this pest. The arrows indicate uh, the application uh, timing. So um, the first application, uh, you can see a little bump up of damage because these pests are constantly coming in from the outside. But then uh, we made the second application and you can see seven days later in the purple bar, um, there's virtually, or actually that's 21 days, uh, no injury, basically stayed the same and another seven days later, just a little bit of injury. So with the subsequent application, we're seeing some additional control. Um, we do plan to uh, continue our trials on flea beetle, um, evaluating different rates uh, and timings in the future. So this concludes uh, the formal presentation with slides today, but we'd like to take some time to answer any questions that you may have or hear about any problems you may be experiencing in your own production. Um, and I'll turn it over to Michael Olakowski, who is going to be monitoring our Q&A uh, box for any questions that you may have. Michael? Yeah, we have uh, two uh, questions and answers there. Will the presentation be available later as a recording? And uh, Brandon, I believe we will have it available. Can you comment? Yes, we will have it and it will be sent out to any, anyone who signed up for this. And we'll have the, the recording of the presentation for any of you who may have missed the very beginning. And we'll also have the PDF available as shown by Mark and Nancy today. We also have a question, uh, what kind of medallion drench our SC formulation or the WDG formulation? And the medallion is available in ornamental uh, crop protect, uh, production as the WDG. The SC formulation is a uh, golf course uh, oriented product. So it would be with the uh, WDG. Mark, uh, here's one uh, new one coming in. Should we start reducing feed now? It is at 300 ppm right now. Mark? So yes, I would say uh, if, you're, if you're still up at 300, you can drop that to 200 without a problem. Um, the reality is you can grow your whole mum crop between 200 and 250 without a problem. So um, as we get to the point where we want flowering more, uh, I would say drop your concentration down. Very good. Uh, that's all the questions in the Q&A. Uh, to wrap up, thanks everybody for checking in. Uh, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Nancy, and uh, Olivia in the background there, and of course, Brandon for pulling together the uh, technical details of this webinar. Thank you, everybody, um, and stay in touch. Uh, you have our emails, and you can always uh, find us on our website, uh, whether it's Syngenta Flowers or, Syn or the www.greencastonline.com. Thanks, all.